was born in Rawalpindi, which is the northwest of Pakistan. I did, I think, the first three years of primary in Pakistan. But then my grand uncle, who had been living here, uh, had been back to Pakistan, and when he came back here, I came with him uh, um, at that time. That was, uh, I think I was about the age of seven, seven or eight, when I came here. And I started here from primary one, and uh, at that time I was a bit more intelligent, I think, than I was just now. So I managed to skip a few classes and I managed to get it back up to my own age. Uh, so I did my primary here for primary one and then I went to secondary at uh, the old Woodside Secondary School and then I went to University of Strathclyde and did a degree in electrical and electronic engineering. Just I think when I arrived here, I suspect it was 58 or 15, 59 years. Any idea why, because your grandfather was here, because your grand uncle was here, that's why you chose to come to Scotland? Well, you know, I was very young at that time, so I didn't choose anything. <laughs> why did I come here? I think my parents were, like any parents from the subcontinent, the, the things, the, the ambition they had for their children was that they would be educated. And I think they sent me here to be educated in a, a good environment. Um, so. As I said myself, I was too young to make any decisions, but I, I, that, that's the reason that I came here. When my parents were back home. Um, I stayed here with my grand uncle. My uncle was also here, so I I lived in both households um, at different times of the week. Uh, it was good. Uh, I did miss my parents, obviously, especially when I was first here. I was very very young, uh, and living in a household which is not your own family's does have its challenges, uh, but I have to say, generally speaking, um, I was very well looked after and uh, I was made to feel part of the family. Uh, as I said, there were challenges, but I think those challenges were perhaps instrumental in me taking the direction of life that I did take later on uh, in a positive way. The first time I went back, um, after I'd come here, I think it, was, must, it must have been seven, eight years before I went back. Um, but after that I went, uh, I would save up money, I was just, obviously I was a student and I would save up money. In those days, the British government gave grants <laughs> to those who were students. And out of my uh, study grant, I managed to save, after two or three years, enough to take a trip back to my family. And I would stand, spend the summer holidays there. Um, and I really enjoyed those times going back to the village in which I had been born uh, and spending uh, a month there, which has made me, uh, how can I say, it's not that I'm not belonging here, not belonging there, but I, when I'm here, I feel the pull of my village back there. And when I'm there, I feel the pull of my Glasgow village here. Uh, I love both places uh, equally. Um, I'm comfortable in both, but uh, obviously not possible to stay in both at the same time. When I came here, um, I remember my uncle and most of his friends used to do um, selling out of a suitcase. They would buy clothes, mostly ladies' clothing, uh, from warehouses here, which were mostly in the south side. And then they would put them in a suitcase and they would take a bus to a locality outside of Glasgow. And they would spend the day going from door to door, door to door, selling stuff. And uh, um, people are very, very, very good. Scottish people are wonderful hosts, very kind, very generous people. And every house they went to, they would be offered a cup of tea and some snacks, etc. And they would come back in the evening. And I remember in the old mosque that we used to have in Oxford Street, is it 27? I think it's 27 Oxford Street, on the first floor, that in the evening you would see these people coming there. They would come directly from work, take a bus, they would take a bus back to the mosque, not to home, to the mosque. 
and then they would take out off their outer clothing and they would, underneath they would have their uh, kurta and shalwar uh, and they would do their prayer and they would, feel, they would sit there and they would talk about how their day had gone. So most of the people were in, in these sort of jobs. Uh, other people were doing factory work. Hardly anybody you would see who was in any sort of professional uh, employment um, or in a consultative position. That has been quite a big change. Now we're into this third generation, we see most youngsters, quite a large number of youngsters now, going into the professional uh, areas uh, and much less um, numerically the number of people who are actually into menial jobs. So that's been quite a change. My uncle did and many of the people who, I used to go to the mosque regularly at that time, many of the people who came to the mosque they were into this in the same sort of employment. Um, so um, to to uh, to us or to me, what was uh, really interesting was the fact that instead of going home after such a hard day's work, they felt much more comfortable in the mosque, and they treated the how the, the mosque as a home from home in that sense. Uh, they would come into the mosque, they would take their. Uh, coats and jackets off and uh, underneath their trousers they would have the shalwar and on the top they would have the kutta and they would do their wuzu and they would do their prayer and they would sit and would discuss how the day had gone and uh, they had a wonderful time they were all happy although the, the, the jobs are menial but the environment is very good um, you know wherever they went they were looked on as guests and as well as people providing a service and they treated very very well and I wouldn't say this is unique to Scottish people, but it is something which really brings out a special quality of the Scottish people, which is this uh, being an extremely good host, uh, very similar to uh, people in Pakistan in the northwest frontier area. Very, very similar and, and a wonderful quality. Uh, and I have lived in Glasgow by choice up to now. And one of the things uh, that has kept me here is, is this sort of uh, feeling uh, and, and care that the Scottish people have for anybody who comes here. Now, when they went out, some people went to places nearby like uh, Falkirk and uh, you know um, peripheral towns to Glasgow. But I remember in later times when my um, uncle, for, for example, had managed to, from his savings, buy a, a van, that he would go as far as uh, Oban and Fort William. Occasionally, if it was a weekend, he would take me with him. And I remember going with him as a, as a young child and going into the houses and uh, the nice treatment that uh, the people gave. And he would open his suitcase and, you know, it wouldn't, wouldn't be just the household, other people would come from other sides and they would sit and they would, oh yes, I like this, I like that, and they would buy stuff. And it was almost uh, like being part of that, that household while you were there. Uh, you, didn't, you didn't feel as you were there on a commercial venture, but rather as, as, as a guest. Uh, so the, the, that's a wonderful quality, uh, I would say, of the Scottish people. When I finished my university, I had thought long and hard uh, about what to do. One thing I would have liked to have done at that time was perhaps to go into teaching. But I thought for that I would have to do a postgraduate uh, course. My father in Pakistan, um, at that time, when I graduated from Strathclyde with a uh, degree in electrical electronics, he decided that uh, I had been away from home long enough. So he said, you should come home. And uh, being a, a good Muslim son, I had no choice but to follow his advice. So I thought, what am I going to do there? So I, from here, <coughs> I applied for a job to the uh, Atomic Energy Commission in Pakistan. And they are, like all uh, organizations in Pakistan, very, very slow in communication. Uh, I think it took about three months for them to respond to my application. And uh, then I responded to them and took them another three months before they said, OK, you come. So I went from here intending to take a job up with the Atomic Energy Commission. When I arrived there, they, they put additional restrictions uh, on me before I could join, uh, one of which was, I now understand it, 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 it makes sense, is that you have to give up 
any other nationality that you have uh, if you're working for a Transgender Energy Commission. I decided that wasn't for me and I was wondering what to do when uh, a friend of mine uh, introduced me to a potential job in the, uh, in the university arena. There, there's an organization called University Grants Commission. It's based on an organization in the UK called University Grants Commission. It's an organizational um, backing for all the universities of Pakistan. And there was a vacancy there and I applied for that. And definitely not according to my expectations, I, I got the job. There was a large competition for it. The people from all over Pakistan came for that. But it's the, it's the blessing of Allah. You know, He sometimes opens doors for you which really you don't deserve. And I got a job there as a systems analyst uh, in Islamabad, um, working in the Atomic, in the University Grants Commission. Um, so I, I worked there for about three years. Uh, but then unfortunately, one of the problems that we have in third world countries is corruption. And corruption raised its head uh, in the form of a contract which was put out uh, for six mini computers to serve the needs of six of the universities of Pakistan. I being the technical person there, I had the job of um, selecting the company uh, out of all the applications to supply that equipment. I found during that process that uh, unfortunately the decision that I had made was overturned without my knowledge and uh, it was, take, it was uh, changed for another company which was a Pakistani company which had nothing to do with the computers but that the people who had made this decision, who were members of the government, uh, each of them got 500,000 uh, rupees as part of the deal. When I found out I was obviously I was very very angry, very annoyed and uh, I tried to see if anything could be done but I found that it's very very difficult in Pakistan to do anything. Uh, and I finally decided to resign, and then that's what eventually did. I resigned from my post. How long were you working in Pakistan for? Uh, it's three or four years, I'm not quite sure. Uh, which I worked there for about three or four years. Uh, and it was only this, unfortunately, this incident which forced me to, to resign. Uh, otherwise, I was enjoying my employment. I was working uh, both uh, as a systems analyst but also as a teacher because the place I worked was a computer training center, government owned computer training center, which uh, supplied the needs of the top organizations, government organizations of Pakistan, like the Pakistan Science Foundation, the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, GHQ, uh, um, etc., etc. And people from there would come there to get trained in, 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 in the use of computers and computer applications, etc. Uh, I was one of the teachers that uh, worked there on that basis as well. It was enjoyable, but unfortunately, once the corruption raised its heads, I did not feel comfortable working in that environment. When I resigned from Pakistan, I made the decision to come, with my father's permission, to come back to the UK. And uh, I got a job eventually uh, as a systems engineer in a national company uh, which serviced and supplied computer equipment uh, and this was based in Manchester. Uh, I worked there for about three years and then I was offered the chance to move back to Glasgow as the company was expanding its area of operation. So I came back to my uh, great city of uh, Glasgow and uh, I carried on working here as a systems engineer. Um, most of my employment has been in this area, in this arena. In fact, it has been in this arena until recently, about a couple of years ago, when I was made redundant at the beginning of this financial turmoil. Uh, my company was looking to reduce its uh, costs, as all commercial companies do, and uh, I was made redundant at that time. I then thought about what to do after that, um, keeping in mind that uh, there are so many graduates in electronics and in computing that I would find it very difficult to get another job. I decided to retrain and a couple of years ago I retrained as a secondary school teacher. Um, 
unfortunately at that time I also had a problem with one of my kidneys which was uh, cancerous. Um, I had an operation to remove that. That had an effect on my memory uh, which short term memory reduced you know, uh, very very badly. Uh, it didn't allow me to actually go on to do the teaching. So uh, at the moment I'm unemployed and probably there isn't going to be uh, any chance of re-employment because I'm, uh, I will be 62 in about a few days in fact. So there isn't that long to go. How do you say so, so young? <laughs> yes, um, most people when I, tell, when I say I'm 62 they, they get quite surprised. And they say, you know, you don't look 62. I really believe, in my case, that it was due to the fact that inside, in my heart, I always believed I was young. Right up to a few years ago, I had uh, an attitude that I was young. I behaved as young. I kept um, my social life mostly with young people. And uh, even now some people, young people who are maybe the age of uh, 20 or 25, they will say Brother Huck rather than Uncle Huck. Anybody else at my age will be called Uncle Huck. <laughs> uh, so I think it's an attitude of mind really uh, that makes quite a difference uh, in your physical appearance and in your outlook. I was very fortunate. Very early on when we had this one mosque in Glasgow at uh, Oxford Street, Myself and youngsters of my age, we were extremely lucky that we had certain people living here who made it their mission to try and guide Muslim youth into the right direction. Uh, they spent their time and their money and their effort with us to try and make us into useful Muslims and it had some effect uh, on quite a lot of us. Uh, therefore, from an early age, my identity primarily has been as a Muslim. I see myself first and foremost as a Muslim. And then after that, it's about equal between being uh, Scottish and Pakistani. Not British, not English, but Scottish, clearly Scottish and Pakistani. I love Scotland, I love the people of Scotland, I love the surroundings of, of Scotland, it's a beautiful country, beautiful people. But then my own country is the country of my birth and where you are born, I think God puts in you a natural love for that place, no matter how terrible it may be seen to other people. So I have a great love uh, for my own country and particularly with the, my own place, the village where I was born. When I'm sitting here sometimes, in my mind's eye, I can see the uh, paths within and surrounding my village on which we used to walk as children uh, and play in the, in the fields and, and all the games that we used to play and the trees that we used to climb. So I have, have a love for, for, for both, but primarily my identity as a Muslim uh, who is living in Scotland and sometimes in Pakistan. Before I am, in fact, in, in Trinistan, Oxford Street, yeah. We, um, we had the first, I would perhaps say, the first uh, youth organization in the UK. Uh, it was again thanks to those brothers who, who took this mission to guide us. We formed an organization called the Young Muslim League. And we had regular meetings. We had in 27 Oxford Street, thanks to these brothers, we had table tennis tables, we had card and board. Um, and we used to meet there regularly and, and enjoy those uh, games, but also we used to learn from uh, these elders, uh, some of whom were from, uh, from Egypt and some from the Far East in Malaysia. Um, so we had these facilities, um, but we also used to, in those times, uh, write, publish, and print a magazine and in those days you, you didn't have electronic media so we actually used to type it on a typewriter and we would then we cyclosal it on a hand 
wound cyclosiling machine and then we would put it together and staple it by hand. That magazine went as far as Africa and France and Canada in those days. And we had uh, um, some people who were affiliated in places like London. So that magazine created uh, uh, an identity and a knowledge uh, about this Young Muslim League in many, many far off places. Uh, it was pioneering days and uh, I think that uh, that perhaps at that time would have been uh, a very important basis for the, the, the following youth movements that sprung up in, in, in the UK, like the Young, Muslim, uh, Young Muslims and the UMO, etc. Identity is, is such a, an important issue and um, I found when I completed my course, part of my course involved me actually going into school and teaching. One of the stints of my teaching was in Bella Houston Academy. Bella Houston Academy at this moment has about 40 to 41 percent Asian youth in there. And I found that uh, most of the Asian youth the vast majority of the youth now you find in school, they are totally confused about their identity. They, they do not know if they are Muslims, they do not know if they are Asian, or if they are Pakistani, or if they are Scottish. And I will put this down to a failure in the community. Uh, we as a community, we have really failed uh, to guide the youngsters of today as we had been guided by this small group of people in the olden days. Professional people who had, who had realized the importance of identity and had given us their time and their effort. Now there is unfortunately no authority which is doing that job adequately. As a result, even those youngsters who are involved in Islamic groups, even they are to some extent confused about themselves. So it is a, it's a very important issue, but I think it not being adequately catered for in the future, it is going to create major problems for our community and for the community that we live in, because whatever we do will impinge on the community around us. What we should be as Muslims is very important, very positive role models. We are not, unfortunately, and this is something that I really feel we as a community have to take uh, steps to remedy. We were lucky, as I said, these, these brothers, we had uh, several professors uh, who were teaching in, in those days, it was known as Paisley College of Technology. Now it's a uh, university now. Uh, one was a student professor, one was a lecturer. Um, so th that was one group of people who guided us. Um, later on, there was a group of postgraduate students from Malaysia, uh, who were members of a uh, Muslim organization, and they took uh, they took us on basically as, as one of their projects, and they spent a lot of time with us, uh, trying to guide us. So we had professional people, very strong, very active Muslims, uh, as role models for us, and watching them and thinking of the time and effort they put in for us, made us feel that we have to do at least as much as they have done. So what they fed into the community, into us in fact, we who were their pupils, we then felt that we had to put this back into the community in turn. Uh, this is, I think, is this, this is missing just now, and we really need to set this up, this sort of structure. The real role models have disappeared. Uh, those were professional people. They were not imams. We don't have now professional people who are involved enough in society with the youngsters for whom they can become role models. We now have a concept of, for instance, youth now. It is an understood concept that only youth can guide youth, which ends up in some cases as the blind leading the blind. The concept of generation gap, which is an artificially created concept, is so dangerous and so destructive. 
it makes people, it makes elders understand that they can't understand the youngsters and the youngsters are useless. It makes the youngsters understand the elders don't understand them and they're useless. It creates this, unfortunately, a gap of understanding, or rather a gap of misunderstanding, which means that the elders will carry on in an activity which they think is Islamic in their own elder area. The youngsters will carry on in their understanding something which will be quite different from what the, what the elders are thinking. And you will have a gap of understanding. And two groups which are supposedly following the same aim will many, many times, or many, quite often, they'll be working against each other. Uh, so we have taken these things on which are foreign to our understanding and foreign to the way that uh, communities have successfully walked in, in history. And our own history as Muslims, we know that uh, in, 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 in the history where Islam was at the pinnacle of its power, there were youngsters leading elders, and there was elders leading youngsters, and they were always working together. There was never been a situation where youngsters worked separately and elders worked separately. This vacuum, uh, this misunderstanding between the elders and the, and the youngsters, it has to be bridged in some way. If this project uh, allows both groups of people to see, understand what the other group is feeling, the values that they, they value, it's definitely going to help to bridge that gap to some extent. So it can po possibly play a very positive role depending on how well it's exposed to the community. Uh, if the community has a chance to um, avail the, this project and, and, and uh, take part in, in, in the, the showing of all, the, all, all this uh, narrative that you're creating, I think it can play a very useful part. But we really need a lot more than that. That, that can be a first step, but hopefully it should lead to further steps. In the old days, the vast majority of our community was either non-educated or very basic education. Therefore, they had a lack of understanding, number one, of general social behavior, and particularly for those who had come from abroad to try and understand this society was very difficult. We are now into third and even fourth generation. So people born, brought up here, we understand this environment. We understand the culture, we understand the problems, we know the problems that exist. So the role models are there, but they're not involved in this structure of organizing, of organized uh, transfer of ideas, uh, aims and ambitions to the youngsters. That's what's missing just now. We have much, many, many, many more positive role models in society now existing, but they're not before the community and they're definitely not viewed as role models by youngsters. How to bring that about is, is the challenge for us now. How can we bring those role models and the youngsters together to work together as a combined structure, each giving their, 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 their special capability. You know, we have, we have elders who are good role models, we have youngsters who are role models, and if they sit together, they can be, gain benefit from each other. We have some organizations which are trying to work with youngsters. What I believe they need to do is change this uh, mentality of youngsters only being involved with youngsters and elders being involved with elders. We need to have a society in which we sit together and we try to understand each other and we try to fulfill each other's needs. Once we do that, I think a lot of the problem of identity confusion will change and we hopefully will become much more positive role models, not just for our own community, but for the larger community in which we live. And we can be viewed as an asset rather than as now a liability. Islam as it actually was, and Islam as it practically is and should be practiced, is no doubt it is the best form of guidance that humans can have. It is the final and complete uh, system of life that uh, Allah has been kind enough to, to reveal for mankind. So no question about it that it can be the best guidance for all of humanity. The problem is that there are people who are born Muslims like myself and others who practice Islam 
in the way they perhaps understood from their parents or from the Imam in their mosque, who themselves, both the parents and the Imam in the mosque, have a partial understanding of Islam, mostly relegated to rituals. So five times prayer, Hajj, Zakat. But when it comes to the commands in the Quran, which are as much fard as the five times prayer, 90% of people do not even know about them. And if they know about them, they do not value them to the same extent. So we may pray five times a day, but we might have a neighbor living next to us who is in a terrible situation, and we do not even knock his door to ask how he is. As compared to the Islamic guidance, which says that if your neighbor goes to sleep hungry, that on the day of reckoning, you will be asked about that. So we need to understand Islam as it practically was in the time of the Prophet and the Khulafai Rashidin, and now it can be very much so. We have the understanding, we have the ability to access all forms of uh, sources to understand Islam properly and to practice it in this society. Most of our community is wealthy, they, they have nothing lacking. All they need really is to understand Islam properly, practice it and share it with those who are on their left and right. If we can do that, then we can become this asset in society which as Muslims we are expected to be. Uh, and that is uh, hopefully what, uh, what we uh, as a community should be looking towards. In those days, Muslims were, were very few and uh, government departments did not recognize the needs of uh, Muslims at all. They did not understand them. Uh, they did not realize there was a, pro a problem or a anything that needed help. So it was very difficult. Um, we were discriminated much more so than we are now, uh, both as Asians and on top of that as Muslims. That is reduced to, to, to some extent. So in those days it, it was quite difficult. Uh, as time has gone on and uh, Islam has gained uh, more following and more understanding, uh, we find that uh, the discrimination has, has lessened to, to some extent. However, we have a, a new problem now. Uh, in my understanding there is now a challenge for the West. The West has reached the pinnacle of its commercial uh, superiority and it can see its graph going down. In my understanding they view Islam and the Muslim world as the most potentially powerful competitor in the future. That has resulted in a directed campaign at globally at Islam and Muslims uh, which has um, resulted in the West generally trying to control the resources and the, the political milieu of Muslim countries. So now we know about the, the Arab Spring that's happening just now but if you look at all the people who are the leaders uh, in Muslim countries, you find that all of them to some extent are instituted, financed and kept in place by the Western governments to serve their own purposes. We as Muslims have to understand that we have a duty towards the world to take the world out of this slavery to profit is what we have now. We have a slavery to profit. Everything is sacrificed for profit. In Britain, what do we have now? We have hospitals being shut because they are too costly. We have public uh, sector uh, facilities which have been taken over by private organizations which now run for profit. As a result, the public suffers, the few get richer, and the great number of people get poorer. We as Muslims, we have a very, very, very strong role to play, being here in the, in the West. Um, so it's, it's very important really that we practice our Islam and uh, we get involved in society. One of the things we have done as Muslims which has created a big problem 
for our community and for the community that we live in is that we have, up to now, we have been isolating ourselves from society. We have been an intern society. We have been thinking that as long as we look after ourselves, it doesn't matter what happens outside our house, which is a very naive understanding. As a result, our own community has sunk down. We have many youngsters now involved in drugs, uh, many involved in immorality. Uh, and this is due to the fact that we have not been involved in society positively. There are now signs that Muslims are beginning to be involved. For instance, now in, in Scotland we have some youngsters recently elected into the government. We have people that involved at local council level. And that involvement is, I would hope, the beginning of a positive involvement from Muslims which will allow them to, uh, again, work as an asset for the society. Well, um, when I first heard about the Heritage Project, uh, just hearing the name uh, didn't really give me much. But when I talked to some people, and I found really that the idea was to try and chart the skills, capability, and understanding of those who had been involved in living in this society and try and pass it on to others who would be coming. Um, I thought that was an excellent idea. Quite often we have wonderful people living amidst, amidst us who have done amazing things, but because we have not charted their journey, all that expertise, all that capability, all that positivity is lost for the future. In this way, by putting it down into accessible material and media, that skill, that knowledge, that role modeling is available for posterity and it can help to inspire people in the future to learn from the past, to move on to bigger and better things in the future.